The crushing brutality of the cross gave way to dumbfounding bewilderment. Jesus was dead. Then, three days later, he showed up. After Jesus ascended, the Holy Spirit poured out on the early church and began his journey across the oceans and across the millennia to collide with you as you sit in this room today. The gospel crossed mountains. The gospel crossed cultures. The gospel crossed hills, valleys, and what you do when you leave this theater carries the story further. The book of Acts began on the other side of the mountains to our east. It continues in your heart, and its next chapter begins on the sidewalk outside. This is the book of Acts. I want you to see what your God is capable of. Redemption Church, I want you to see what your God can do. That's why we've chosen the book of Acts to follow the Gospel of John. We saw Jesus' life and ministry as the fulfillment of the Logos, the Son of Man, the resurrected one, and now Jesus speaks in the beginning of the book of Acts, and this is a book whose events are contemporary. These events described in this text are still happening, and every extant biblically orthodox church can trace its ancestral roots back to the events described here. In fact, without an iota of hyperbole, I can say in good conscience that the United States of America would not be what it is today were it not for the events of the text we're covering today in Acts chapter 16. As of this text, the gospel is going to enter Europe. Europe would colonize the new world, the new world would become the US. Here is the moment that the gospel entered Europe. It takes place in Acts chapter 16. I want us to get a running start from the end of chapter 15. Our curriculum and our devotions have taken us up to Acts chapter 15 all the way through verse 35. This is verse 36 of Acts chapter 15 and the story begins with a dispute. The story begins with the breaking of fellowship. It seems like a bad story, but I want you to watch what God does with this breaking of fellowship. After some time had passed, Paul said to Barnabas, let's go back and visit the brothers and sisters in every town where we have preached the word of the Lord and see how they're doing. Barnabas wanted to take along John Mark. But Paul insisted that they should not take along this man who had deserted them in Pamphylia and had not gone on with them to the work. They had such a sharp disagreement that they parted company, and Barnabas took Mark with him and sailed off to Cyprus. But Paul chose Silas and departed after being commended by the brothers and sisters to the grace of the Lord. He traveled through Syria and Cilicia, strengthening the churches. So we saw all this in Acts chapter 13, John Mark chose not to join Paul and Barnabas when a time of ministry came. And for that reason, Paul has trust issues and he breaks fellowship because he doesn't want to bring him along. He doesn't trust him not to abandon them again in a time of need. But Barnabas trusts John Mark. Now, spoiler, they are going to reconcile again later on in their ministry. But look at what God just did here. Barnabas and John Mark will go back to Cyprus. This is a retracing of the original route. The original intent here was to retrace their steps and encourage the churches that have been planted since the beginning of the book of Acts. But now, because of this breaking of fellowship, Paul is going to other territories. He has effectively, God has effectively used even this parting of company to double the reach of the team. Now you have two teams encouraging churches and even helping plant churches. God works through all of this. He even works through denominationalism. God is able to work absolutely all things together for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose. That doesn't mean that all things are good, not at all, but it does say that God will use even things like this for ultimate good. Because of this, the team splits up. Because of that, their reach is expanded. Because their reach is expanded, it arrived on these shores. Keep reading with me. This is Acts chapter 16. Paul went on to Derby and Lystra, where there was a disciple named Timothy, the son of a believing Jewish woman, but his father was a Greek. That's all we know about Timothy's father. He doesn't seem to be in the picture here. But this mixture of Greek and Jewish 
for the composition of their family meant that they weren't exactly included. Poor Timothy was, he was, he, he felt like he was an outsider between two different worlds, not fully accepted by the Greeks because of his Jewish heritage, not fully accepted by the Jews because of his Greek heritage. And Timothy is stuck. But watch what happens next. It's gross. <laughs> the brothers and sisters at Lystra and Iconium spoke highly of him. Paul wanted Timothy to go with him so he took him and circumcised him because of the Jews who were in those places, since they all knew that his father was a Greek. We have a circumcision station available. I'm just kidding. This was a cultural barrier, and Timothy was not respected by his Jewish mentors and superiors because he wasn't circumcised, because his father was a Greek. It, it, it's, it's a sad story. This, this kid had nothing to do with the tensions that existed between Jews and Gentiles. And now, because of Jesus, there is no Jew or Gentile or, or barbarian or Scythian or slave or free, but Christ is in all. It's, the, it's at the, the turn of the covenant and of all the times in history to be stuck between two worlds. Poor Timothy should have served as a linchpin to bring the two of them together. But he wasn't fully accepted by the Greeks and he wasn't fully entrusted by the Jews. And so now, as a relatively grown young man, he undergoes circumcision not in a way that would ever be seen by anybody, but just would be understood. This is the drastic measure that he took in order to be accepted by the Jewish community, and he shouldn't have had to. In fact, Titus, another of Paul's protégés, for whom the, the tertiary of the pastoral epistles is named, would refuse to do the same. See Galatians 2, 3. Titus refused to be circumcised as a grown man because they need to get over it. Now we've seen in our devotions that there was a church council at Jerusalem. The Judaizers, whom you're gonna hear more about when you read the book of Galatians, were insisting it's not just enough to believe in Jesus, you also have to undergo circumcision and obey the law of Moses. This dispute rose up and they meet in Jerusalem. The resulting letter dispels that, which is good, because you don't need to obey the law of Moses to be saved. You don't need to undergo circumcision in order to be saved. That is, a, that, that is a, a fatuous lie. I would call it a satanic lie. The whole point of Christ's sacrifice on the cross is that we are atoned for in our sins and we just believe. If you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord. Believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. Say it loud. You will be that's it. There's no circumcision. There's no adherence to dietary law. There's no supplement needed. Uh, the idea of a supplementary legalistic action to append the work of Christ on the cross would presuppose that Christ's work were insufficient. And so there's nothing, just Jesus, just Jesus, just Jesus. Jesus doesn't need your help saving you. You can't do anything anyway. We are dead in our sin. So Titus, on a principled stance, would refuse to undergo circumcision. Timothy, however, would undergo circumcision, and both of these are protégés of Paul's. So Timothy undergoes incredible pain just to be accepted by the Jewish men in his community, and he shouldn't have had to. The Jerusalem letter did dispel the notion that circumcision were salvific. However, they also just kind of threw in some suggestions. And, and one of those was more than a suggestion. One of those was, you know, like, don't commit sexual immorality. Okay, that's great. That's consistent with the character of God. But the others were basically these suggestions that people still stick to Old Testament dietary laws in some ways. Now, that was the I'm sure the worst thing that Peter could have endured because he was already stumbling in that regard before. And we'll see in Galatians that he stumbles in it again. Moreover, it's initially received and it's celebrated and it's good because it, it frees the gospel from this legalistic entanglement. But watch what happens historically between Acts and Galatians. There are people who cling to these suggestions and they become legalistic about these suggestions and they begin to believe that these suggestions from the church in Jerusalem, from the elders of the church in Jerusalem are now necessary and they shape their doctrine around a personal conviction. They shape their doctrine around a preference and a suggestion. 
and it ends up causing people to stumble in the future. Initially, however, it's good news, especially because the Judaizers had done a fantastic job of profligating this lie that in order to be saved, you needed to be circumcised. In its original intent, and in its original recip uh, uh, reception, the letter from the elders of the church of Jerusalem dispelled that myth, and that is a good thing. It wouldn't actually become a problem until later. Similar to the church in Jerusalem. Initially, they lived and they had everything in common. And that was a great way to start things off. As we continue in the book of Acts, what you'll see is they go broke as a result. So this letter from the church of Jerusalem, similarly, is a great thing at first because primarily it just dispels this lie that you had to undergo circumcision in order to be, in order to be saved. Now, verse four, as they traveled through the towns, they delivered the decisions reached by the apostles and elders at Jerusalem for the people to observe. So the churches were strengthened in the faith and grew daily in numbers. This is great news. This is great news. The, 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 the council at Jerusalem has dispelled the mythology and now the church is growing. Jesse, why, why, why does the church in America not grow in the same way? Well, let's talk about this. For one thing, the gospel was hot off the presses and it was brand new to Gentile nations at the time. So in one sense, you had a whole lot of people who had never heard the gospel before at all. And we've seen story after story in these central chapters of Acts wherein Gentiles are ecstatic to know that the Jewish God cares about them, that they can be saved. And so the Gentile church is exploding and God is gradually healing this rift between Jews and Gentiles. In our context, in our setting, we have people who think they understand the gospel and they don't. So you have to counter this false gospel teaching. Now this is far easier in Seattle than it was in the deep South. If you survey 10 people on the street in the deep South and you ask them if they're Christians, nine of them will say, yeah, I go to that church every Easter and you've got to have this really awkward conversation that is literally, I mean, it feels as awkward as explaining to someone, your baby is ugly. Like I would rather have that conversation than this one. You're not actually a Christian. You are in fact going to hell. Like that's actually, that's actually less awkward than the, the, that's, the, 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 the baby conversation would be less awkward. I can't tell you how hard this is in the deep South in order to evangelize somebody, you got to convince them that they're lost first. Now here's the upside of living in Seattle. This is where I actually prefer doing evangelism here. I saw two people saved yesterday. And you know what? I don't have to convince anybody that they're not a Christian here. People are actually kind of proud of the fact that they're not Christians here. They, they know that they're not Christians. And so in my perspective, take it from me, having been born and raised in the deep South and then lived in the heavily diverse area of Orlando and metropolitan Nashville, now having come here, I prefer it this way. It actually removes the most awkward step in evangelism for me. I don't have to convince someone that they're not saved before they can get saved. Seattle people are actually quite proud of the fact that they're not saved. And so we just start with the gospel. It's actually easier this way. Now let's continue in the text. Watch what happens historically here. I'm gonna, I'm gonna try to coach you through it. I'm gonna use the, hev I, I know I used to have like uh, a ultra high definition uh, environmental projection system, you know, equipped with uh, a beta version of Google Earth Suite 2 that could show this, but now, I've, I'm, I'm just gonna use my hand, okay? They went through the region of Phrygia and Galatia. They had been forbidden by the Holy Spirit to speak the word in Asia. And when they came to Mysia, they tried to go into Bithynia, but the spirit of Jesus did not allow them. Passing by Mysia, they went down to Troas. During the night, Paul had a vision in which a Macedonian man was standing and pleading with him, cross over to Macedonia and help us. After he had seen the vision, we immediately made efforts to set out for Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. Did you know that God's guidance comes often in the form of a red light? Twice the apostles are forbidden from going somewhere they wanted to go. Would you thank God for the red lights in your life? Because you don't know what he's protecting you from. They tried to enter an area and evangelize. Like what, surely that's God's will that I go to that city and evangelize, yes? But the Holy Spirit, Numa Agio, prevents them from doing so. And so they continue on, a, on a, a westward trajectory, now going around the Mediterranean Sea. And they try to turn northward once more. And 
Numa Yesu, the spirit of Jesus forbids them from doing so. This is the one time this is mentioned this way in the text. And I don't know exactly what it means. The spirit of Jesus prevented them. My most biblical, my most biblical guess is that it was the same thing that Paul experienced in Acts chapter nine when he encountered the resurrected Jesus on the road to Damascus that God would tell them not to go this direction. Now what's, what's fascinating is that in the Holy Spirit saying, no, don't go this way, and the Spirit of Jesus saying, no, don't go this way, is that they're not given subsequent directions. They're not given coordinates. They're not given a Google Maps bearing. All right? they're, rather, they're just told, nope, not here, nope, not here. If you're waiting on God to like slide a script under your bedroom door each morning, printed in Helvetica 12 point font, stapled at a perfect 45 degree angle in the top left corner, wherein you know exactly what to say to whom and when, oh, it turns out it's God's will that I acquire this business today. That's great. That's not going to happen. You're going to learn to thank God for the red lights. They tried, to enter, they tried to enter Bithynia and God said no. They tried to enter uh, Mysia and God said no. This is God coaching them and coaxing them farther westward because the farther westward they went, the closer they got to the southeasternmost corner of what would become Europe. And God knew in his sovereignty that these regions that Paul and Silas and company were trying to enter but were forbidden from doing so by the Lord, would later be reached by the churches to whom Peter ministered. If you open up 1 Peter chapter 1, you'll see that it's a letter written to the churches in Asia, Cappadocia, Bithynia. It, it's written to the very cities that Paul and company wanted to enter in Acts 16. God is sovereign. God had a plan for those cities. It didn't involve Paul and Silas. God had Peter appointed to come and minister to these churches in modern day Turkey, then kind of referred to as Asia Minor. Now God was moving them westward and he called them to Macedonia, named for Philip of Macedon, the father of Alexander the Great. This was a heavily, heavily influential region. This is where you're gonna see the gospel enter Philippi and Thessalonica. That's where you get the book of Philippians from and first and second Thessalonians. This is God at work. In his sovereignty, he had Peter ministering to these regions, and so he was giving them red lights. If God gives you a red light, nope, not that way, then you thank him and you keep on moving. Don't sit there and wait for the script to show up under your door. You just go. You test and you approve. Okay, young students, college students, singles, looking for God's will for your life in terms of who you're going to marry, what you're going to do professionally, and what's next for you. The way that we understand God's will is by testing and approving. Paul's prayer for the very church at Philippi whose origins are accounted for in this seemingly insignificant logistical interlude or this, this is my prayer that your love would abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight so that you may be able to discern what is best and may be pure and blameless until the day of Christ Jesus filled with the fruit of righteousness to the glory and praise of Jesus Christ that you would be able to discern. The, the Bible speaks about discernment, but often Christians trying to discern God's will suddenly act like mystics. All right, God, just give me a sign. Give me a sign, God. Would you cause it to rain in exactly the letters that spell out who I'm supposed to marry? Just something subtle like that. If only, if only God had revealed his will perfectly in written form, bound with a single cover for convenience, also made pocket size. If only I could just hear the voice of God. If you want to hear the voice of God, read your Bible out loud. God has revealed it to you. It's about discernment. Be filled with the Spirit. Repent from sin and then test and approve God's good and pleasing and perfect will. What does it mean to test? Try something out. That didn't work. Keep on moving. You know, just like Paul and Silas in Acts 16. <laughs> Whoop, not that way. Moving on. As opposed to, Whoop, not that way. I'm going to sit and sulk. Do you see the difference? 
They had discernment. Did you see the word concluded? Even after they've been given this vision of a man from Macedonia, they didn't hold this vision necessarily on par with inspired scripture. Paul is the author of multiple books in the New Testament. He's able to discern when God is giving him a divine word, but this involved deliberation, which means that they concluded after reasoning that vision could have been from the Lord, that we would go to Macedonia. Now look at God's long-term play here. It's phenomenal. It's phenomenal to consider. I know that Sam Harris criticized God. <laughs> That's funny. Because he said, if I were to resurrect from the dead and start the gospel, I wouldn't have, I wouldn't have stuck it in Jerusalem and around the Mediterranean. I would have gone to Asia where they already had formal education forming. God had that plan so that the gospel would move across, across the Atlantic to the new world where it would be cradled and where it would help facilitate global missions in China, which, by the way, can we praise God for this? The fastest growing church in the world. God knew exactly what he was doing. It's almost as though he's sovereign or something, amen? All right, I'm sorry, Sam Harris. You're not as smart as God. He already knew about China before China even existed. God had all of this in mind. He's using us today as God calling anybody in this room on global mission. I pray he is. I pray he is. God knew exactly what he was doing. He worked through the closed doors because Paul and Silas would move westward. They would go to Philippi and Thessalonica, the capital city. Philippi is a heavily influential area. I don't think Thessalonica was as big of a city as Philippi, but Philippi was positioned right on a coast. And it's in a port city. And it it's, has this huge influx of diversity of people from all over the world. Can... Can you think of another city that is positioned in one of the most powerful countries in the world and it's right on a seaport and there are people from every nation all gathered together, their culture all in one place, right in this influential city where whatever happens there tends to spread in, inland? Can you think of any city at all like that? Can anybody relate? Yeah, me neither. Let's keep reading. We have a lot in common with this text. This word is living and active. I look at Philippi and I'm like, that's Seattle. It is a diverse port city that's heavily influential in the area. It's heavily prosperous. And that's where God put his gospel. Man, don't you wish God would plant a church right in the middle of where God, of where the church is needed the most? Welcome to the Redemption Church. I want you to pray as well for my friend, Rich Sims. Rich, we love you, man. Planting, we gotta celebrate this, okay? I need you to get loud. I know some of you are Baptists, but you gotta get loud, okay? Like, planting the very first church in the heart of Pioneer Square. Can we praise God for that? Rich, we love you guys. We're praying for you, man. This is what God did in Philippi. This is what he's doing right now. You see it? You're a part of the latest edition of this ongoing effort. I'm so glad that God told Paul and Silas not to enter Mysia, not to enter Bithynia, but to continue westward. They get this vision of a man in Macedonia. They move westward, and now watch the rapid fire conversions that are going to take place. We started off with a dispute, and then we moved on to poor Timothy. And now we've seen what seems like logistical details, but actually traces its roots, traces the roots of our nation, because now the gospel has entered Europe. And what you're going to see next, and the rest of the text we're going to cover, are three different hearts. The heart that God divinely opens, and I believe that there are some of those in this room today. You're going to see the demon-possessed heart. Yeah, it's going to get weird. Welcome to the Redemption <laughs> Church. We say whatever the text says, Amen. And then you're going to see a family saved. Watch these different hearts. See if you see the reflection of your own heart. And I've got a story of what happened yesterday that I think will blow your mind, because I know it blew mine. This is Lydia's conversion, beginning in verse 11. From Troas, we put out to sea and sailed straight for Samothrace the next day to Neapolis, and from there to Philippi, a Roman colony and a leading city in the district of Macedonia. We stayed in that city for several days. 
On the Sabbath day, we went outside the city gate by the river where we expected to find a place of prayer. We sat down and spoke to the women gathered there. A God-fearing woman named Lydia, a dealer in purple cloth from the city of Thyatira, was listening. The Lord opened her heart to respond to what Paul was saying. After she and her household were baptized, she urged us, if you consider me a believer in the Lord, come and stay at my house. And she persuaded us. Yeah, women do that. They go and speak with the women. Again, I'm sorry, my feminist friend, but like the Bible eats your feminism for lunch because women had zero rights, but the gospel just begins with women all the time. The very first evangelist in the New Testament arguably was a woman. You see God do this, and that's the that's story here in Philippi. It begins with just like where, where the women are hanging out. Paul and Silas go there and they begin their evangelistic ministry. And there's a woman there who's a brilliant businesswoman. She has a business dealing in purple cloth. Now that's a heavily, that's a heavily involved process. The only way to obtain purple dye was through the refining of shellfish. And that's a difficult thing to do. It's a rare thing to see done. And the fact that she had a business in purple cloth meant that she was on the cutting edge. She's a very smart woman. And she's just present. You'll notice they weren't even necessarily speaking directly to her. They just went to where the women were gathered. That's verse 13. We sat down and spoke to the women gathered there. They just found a gathering and began to speak. And then there's a woman present, a God-fearing woman named Lydia, a dealer in purple cloth from the city of Thyatira, was listening. The Lord opened her heart to respond to what Paul was saying. God opened Lydia's heart. This is familiar to you if you're a Christian. You remember what this was like. Your coming into salvation was not an act of intellectual assent. It was the Lord opening your heart. Is the Lord opening your heart today, my skeptical friend? I'm incredibly glad that you're here. I'm glad that you're listening to the word of God. This is a story of people who are far from him being drawn near. It's a story whose latest chapter is unfolding in this room. And if that familiar presence has always been there, whom you've tried to keep at bay so that you can stick around with the sins that you enjoy, if that familiar presence is drawing on your heart right now, that's the Holy Spirit of God. That's the same spirit who opened Lydia's heart. I pray that there are hearts newly opened here. Jesse and I were standing in our driveway and we just heard the sound of chatting and music and spike ball and skateboards and students and puppies all around us. Like we just kind of sat in one strategic place and we just took it all in because we could hear, we could hear people parking, we could hear, hear people near the car shop, we could hear students around the fire pit, we could hear the skateboard wheels going and then suddenly stopping. <laughs> and, and, and it was just a beautiful sound. It blessed our souls. And we said to each other, this is God's house. This is the Lord's. This place just belongs to God. I said that every time we go in for band rehearsal, I, I flip on the power breaker to my car shop where we rehearse. I say, God, this is your place. It, it's such a blessing. It blesses our souls. And we see now why God gave us that house. We didn't have the highest offer on that house. The Lord gave it to us. And now we've given it back to God. And it's the most beautiful sound in the world. I guess that makes me Lydia and Jesse Lydia. We're Lydia and Lydia. Because our house is like the home base for the church. Watch what God does. You're going to see Lydia's house come up again. God has been doing this for millennia. Does that sound familiar to you? Can you think about that? A church plant that has a public meeting space but is largely based around someone's house. Can anybody relate to that at all? Me neither. This is still happening today. Look at verse 16. Once, as we were on our way to prayer, a slave girl met us who had a spirit by which she predicted the future. She made a large profit for her owners by fortune telling. As she followed Paul and us, she cried out, these men who are proclaiming to you the way of salvation are the servants of the most high God. She did this for many days. Paul was greatly annoyed. Turning to the spirit, he said, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. 
and it came out right away. When our owners realized that their hope of profit was gone, oh man, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace to the authorities. Bringing them before the chief magistrates, they said, these men are seriously disturbing our city. Like you weren't before. They are Jews and promoting customs that are not legal for us as Romans to adopt or practice. And then look at this. This is that, this is that tipping point. The crowd joined in the attack against them. And the chief magistrates stripped off their clothes and ordered them beaten with rods. After they had severely flogged them, they threw them in jail, ordering the jailer to guard them carefully. Receiving such an order, he put them into the inner prison and secured their feet in the stocks. This, by the way, as you're going to see in the curriculum for this week, was a violation of their rights as Romans. And Paul gets rightly saucy about the fact that his rights have been violated. And you're going to see in the discussion material for our curriculum, a challenge for Christians likewise. If you have the freedom to practice Christianity, you ought to defend it. Because by default, a secular government is not neutral. It's not objective and will seek ever and always to restrict Christianity. To no avail, here we are practicing Christianity two millennia later, despite the best efforts of the most powerful empire in history to restrict it and squash it. But Paul just had his Roman rights violated and he's going to make a righteous scene. And he's going to say, oh, no, no, no. They violated my rights. Let them come down here and escort me out. I mean, he asks for the VIP treatment, and it's a good thing, too, because he sets a good precedent that will allow for the gospel to be shared in Rome in public for a little bit longer. Now, ultimately, it's going to get bad. Hence, Peter's context for writing. You're going to see as, the, as Augustus, Tiberius, Claudius, Vespasian, Nero, as the, as the Roman emperors continue on, persecution just gets worse and worse and worse for the next few centuries. But then ultimately, when Constantine comes around, you see that it's legalized, it's ratified. But at this point in time, it's still legal. And Paul has one last hurrah to stand upon his rights as a Roman and his ability to share the gospel publicly. Let's talk about this demonic exorcism that just took place. This young girl had a demonic spirit by which she was able to predict the future. And this earned her owners, quote unquote, a great deal of profit. So she's possessed by a demon. And did you notice what the demon said? Because it sounds true. Like, did you look at the words that she, by the possession of this spirit, would say over and over again? It actually sounds like, it, it sounds like something you would say, amen, question mark to. Like, amen? I mean, what you're saying is right, but you're a demon, so how do I agree with you? I mean, I mean like, spot the lie in the words. That's what's, that's what's odd about it. These men who are proclaiming to you the way of salvation are the servants of the Most High God. It's a true statement. But when you say a true statement, over and over and over and over again at the top of your lungs for several days straight, you can see how it's not helping at all. In fact, the reason that this demon was saying something remotely true was so as to make it perhaps more difficult for Paul and Silas to rebuke it, because how do you rebuke that? No, we're not servants of the Most High God. No, we're not proclaiming to you the way of salvation. But just for perspective, the Greek word for annoyed here, Paul became greatly annoyed in verse 18. It means to bring on, exhaust, uh, 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 bring on an exhausting, depleting grief, which results in fatigue. It is a very intense word that's translated to annoyed. We lose a little bit of that in our English translations because you, be, you can also be annoyed by the theme song of the, on the game that you're your kid is playing on your cell phone in the back seat. That doesn't apply here. That means annoyed. This means annoyed. That's my rendering <laughs> of the Greek. So she's sabotaging what they're doing. And then Paul turns, it says, to the spirit and said, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And it came out right away. So like, pause the story right there. Praise God, what we just saw is an example of a demonic exorcism. Someone is inhabited by a demon. Paul casts the spirit out, and this woman is set free. Now, that should be a happy ending to the story. But look at these jerks who had enslaved this girl, who ought to have been happy for her that she's now freed from this demonic oppression. They are upset because their meal ticket is gone. 
They're upset because now she can't tell fortunes anymore, or at least pretend to. They're upset because now this poor afflicted woman is free and now they have lost their whole business model. And so they're going, they're going to trump up absurd charges against Paul and Silas. And this is a total miscarriage of justice, that they would be publicly beaten severely with rods for having delivered a woman from demonic oppression. Like, can we stop for a minute and acknowledge the fact like she was possessed by a demon and she's not anymore? Like, is anybody, anybody gonna talk about that and what that indicates? Apparently, they actually are servants of the Most High God. Like, maybe we should repent from sin. No, beat them. That's the response. So these guys who owned this slave, which in its own right has a whole other history to it, has, it, has a whole other message behind it, they're upset because this girl is now freed from demonic oppression. And so look at the lie. Look at the lie they tell. They bring them, they bring them before the chief magistrates. And they said, these men are seriously disturbing our city. They frame it as though these guys are being very disruptive. They are Jews and are promoting customs that are not legal for us as Romans to adopt or practice. So there's like overt anti-Semitism built into the very accusation that they bring before the chief magistrates. And they're trying to appeal to Roman authority. This is where things start to get a little dicey. This is the first time we've actually had trouble in the newborn church in the, in the New Testament era with Rome. So far, all of the opposition has come from Jewish authorities. Now, it's the first time you're going to see people really get in trouble through Rome, and it becomes a big deal. That's partly why Paul rightly champions his rights in our text for the, for the curriculum this week. And then the crowd joined in the attack against them. When you don't truly submit to Jesus as Lord, the state becomes your church. This is something that when I'm asked about the culture shock of moving from the deep south to the Pacific Northwest, one of the biggest differences, after it took us a few months to learn how to throw our trash away properly, one of the other things I've noticed is a shocking, a shocking, a, a shockingly ubiquitous, litigious culture. Okay, I, I, read, I read a label on a battery telling me not to drink the acid. There's a story behind that. <laughs> and the, the, the battery manufacturer, just, they're, they're protecting themselves legally. There's a litigiousness here that I've even seen within churches that is shocking. The same thing's happening in DC right now, but this, this ought not be the case. And here's what it indicates. 1 Corinthians 6 is just true. Okay, there are some bloggers out there who ought to thank God that I believe 1 Corinthians 6 that it's better to be wronged than to go to court with other believers. Now, when Christians take Christians to court, or when Christians appeal to the authority, what they're supposing, first of all, they're absolutely abdicating 1 Corinthians 6, and they're also positing the magistrates, they're positing the state authority as though it were greater than God. You're not doing what I want you to do, so I'm gonna sick on you the greatest authority I have, and that is the government. That indicates a lack of lordship, frankly. I am far more terrified of God than I am of the government, but that is not the case for litigious Christians. For them, their greatest fear is the state, is the government. The greatest authority they can bring down upon the heads of their enemies is government, is the state, is a lawsuit, rather than handing them over to God and trusting the Lord to bring about reconciliation, repentance, and restoration. They immediately appealed to the magistrates because that was their authority. My skeptical friend, have you found this about yourself? That in the absence of an authoritative moral paradigm, that you tend to really lean on the government to help you and save you and take care of you. And that you really enjoy new edicts that are issued because it gives you the chance to show how virtuous and what a good citizen you are. Have you found that your ultimate trust, ultimately what you hope for from your government is that it will care for you? As opposed to others who are perhaps from a more free background who want the government to just get out of the way? Do you appeal to the government as though it's the ultimate authority and arbiter of justice ultimately? 
Have you ever considered that the justice systems of the world today will one day stand before the justice of God? How you feel about the magistrate, how you feel about the state and legislating your own way upon other people, sicking the state on people who wrong you, as it were, indicates a lot about how big your view of God is. Because if I hand someone over to God, they're in far more trouble than they are if I sue them. I would much rather the Lord work on their heart. If I'm honest, any desire that I would have to try to sue someone's pants off is just based in vindictiveness against them. Because when I hand them over to God, what might God do? Restore them. See them repent. Would you consider that for a moment? If you're tempted by this fomenting in your heart that says, I am entitled to better treatment than this. I'm going to enact the legal authorities to have them force my way on someone else. I want to wield the power of government to get what I'm entitled to out of that person. Would you consider for a moment the similarity you have to Eve in the garden when the snake says, you're entitled to more? you actually deserve better. And that fomenting of a fear of missing out, a sense of entitlement, I deserve better, God's holding out on me, I ought to have better than this, as opposed to a gospel understanding of what you and I really deserve. Okay, you and I, what we deserve is hell. That's what we actually deserve because we're sinners. If you're a sinner, would you raise your hand real quick? (laughs) Yeah, we've all sinned. What are the wages of sin? Death. That's what we deserve. That's wages. Wages are what? That's what you get in return for what you've done. If you work hard, you get paid a wage. If you sin, you get death. You're welcome. That's your wage. The wages of sin is death. That's what we actually deserve. Watch for the enemy to sow seeds of entitlement saying, I deserve better than this. I'm entitled to more than this. I've been, God's held out on me here. I deserve more. I need to eat that forbidden fruit. And for that reason, you will seek to foment that anger further and sick the secular authorities on someone as opposed to trusting God to handle them. Let the, especially if it's another Christian, let the Holy Spirit work on them. Don't go to court with fellow Christians. Don't do this. We've been given a process for conflict resolution, and it begins with one-on-one going to that person. Not tweeting about it, not emailing it out to bloggers, going to them one-on-one. Watch for the enemy to foment a sense of entitlement in your heart that says, I deserve better than this, I'm gonna sick the government on them. That's exactly what the people persecuting Paul and Silas did, only their intentions were overtly malicious. They were slave owners whose meal ticket was gone, and so they falsely accused them publicly. By the way, they got their way in the moment. But this, if you choose to be litigious, it's not going to give you what you want and it's gonna cost you more than you can imagine. Watch what happens ultimately. So Paul and Silas are now jailed. We're gonna talk about this demonic exorcism bit, by the way. I've got a story that happened yesterday that absolutely blew my mind. I've got pictures to show you. Verse 25, about midnight, okay, they are in the inner stocks, the inner prison. They are as secured as they possibly can be. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. Suddenly, there was such a violent earthquake that the foundations of the jail were shaking, and immediately all the doors were opened, and everyone's chains came loose. When the jailer woke up and saw the doors of the prison standing open, he drew his sword and was going to kill himself since he thought the prisoners had escaped. See what happens when the state is your God? You're ruled by fear, not motivated by grace not motivated by love and kindness of God unto repentance. You're, mo- you're motivated by fear, just like the people in Lystra and Derby, who were afraid that Paul and Barnabas might be these reincarnations of Zeus and Hermes. And the last time they showed up in this village, they massacred everybody. So here, please, let me make sacrifices to you so that you don't kill me. That's fear. It's fear. In the same way, this poor prison guard is under the fear of what was lowercase l, Lord in his life, that is Rome. And so he would, he would rather end his life than suffer the wrath of his lowercase g, God. 
But Paul cried out in a loud voice, don't harm yourself because we're all here. Paul knew it was coming because he knew what would happen to a Roman centurion who lost track of a prisoner. That seal that was on the tomb of Jesus, any centurion patrolling that tomb, watching over that seal that carried with it the full weight and authority of Caesar himself, if anybody came in or out or touched that seal, the guard would pay for it with his life and possibly more people would too. So that was what motivated the centurion to be vigilant. And when this centurion, who did his job by the way, perhaps more so, took them to the inner stocks, sees that they're gone, sees that they're freed, he's about to end his life. So Paul knows what's coming and he thinks quickly, don't kill yourself, don't harm yourself, we're all here. The jailer called for lights, rushed in and fell down trembling before Paul and Silas. He escorted them out and said, sirs, what must I do to be saved? It's beautiful because he wants to be safe, but do you even still see the legalism that's built into this? What must I do to be saved? Doesn't it sound like the rich young ruler? What must I do to be saved? My inquisitive friend, have you come seeking that exact question? What do I have to do to earn it? What do I have to do to offset the bad things that I've done? What do I have to do in order to be saved? Listen to Paul's answer. This is this is literally it. They said, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. There is freedom in Christ, isn't there? What do I have to do to be saved? Believe in the Lord Jesus. That's the gospel in a sentence. Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. You and your household. Now watch out because this text is sometimes used as a proof text for what's called pedo-baptism, meaning the sprinkling of infants. It is no such text. And just a continuation of the passage will indicate thus. And they spoke the word of the Lord to him along with everyone in his house. Okay, so they're sharing the gospel with the whole household. He took them the same hour of the night and washed their wounds. Right away, he and all his family were baptized. Have you been procrastinating baptism for a while? What are you waiting for? What are you waiting for? Pull out your phone right now. Fill out the connect card. Check the second box. We'll baptize you to the glory of God. He brought them into his house, set a meal before them, and rejoiced because he had come to believe in God with his entire household. Everyone in his home believes, and so everyone in his home is saved and baptized right away. An entire family saved. Again, just like Lydia's household. So we've seen this young girl who's set free from demonic oppression. We've seen Lydia's household saved and a home base is established for the church in Philippi, just like it is here today. God uses house churches, man. And now we've seen this jailer saved along with his whole entire family. When the twins were born, we didn't know what was gonna happen because Asher the Basher came out and he just weighed like four pounds. He could fit in my hand. And he was very premature. He's got his own story, by the way. So does my bride. We don't talk about this very often. My bride had preeclampsia and hypertension. It had to have multiple blood transfusions. Like she almost died multiple times. Asher the Basher also lived in an incubator in the NICU for a long time. But when Aiden was born, it was like everybody who was in the room, suddenly they just lost track of what they were supposed to do. It was like they were all in this choreographed dance that was so fluid because they've done it a hundred times and then suddenly the music stopped and nobody knew what to do next. And so he's hurriedly just rushed into this hole in the back, this window in the back into the NICU and then they just wheel me and Jesse into a room to wait and we begin to just pray and we begin to sing worship songs because he's worthy. And so we were there at night in the hospital, not knowing if Asher or Aiden were alive, not knowing what was going on with Jesse, her lips turning you know, bright yellow at times. And we were just worshiping God. We were just worshiping and praying for our sons. And then the doctors came in and they said, we, this is a direct quote, we cannot explain it. It is a miracle. Your babies are alive. And we looked at the clock and it was midnight. The next morning, I got up at our church in Orlando. It was then called First Baptist Church of Windermere. Today, it's called Family Church. And I had these two super cool duck bracelets on my wrist that let me get into the NICU. And I preached this passage about midnight. That is the darkest hour of night. They had been wrongfully imprisoned. They had been jailed. They had their rights utterly violated. 
And what is their recourse? Worship. Worship until God brings the walls down. Did you see how he shook the prison? By its foundations. Why? Because they're his. It's his bedrock. He can shake it if he wants to. And he frees his men from prison and they're saved. These are miracles that we're seeing. And it's utterly vital to this pastor's heart that every single member of the Redemption Church believes that God is still able, God is still able, God is still able. Christian, behold your God and what he can do. This is what your God is capable of. Have you settled for a status quo that is less than? Have you been reticent to bring the gospel up to coworkers because you're nervous? Look at what your God has done and see what your God is doing. Yesterday, I was scoping out a homeless ministry that I wanted to consider as a partner for the Redemption Church because we're already starting multiple ministries simultaneously and my goal is to have all of them at least booked and running by September that the best way to do homeless ministry rather than obtaining our own permitting and licensing and buying our own van and all that stuff would be just to partner with and provide manpower to a pre-existing ministry. And so I reached out to this one ministry because I knew the pastor. He's a part of a network called Embers that I'm a part of as well. And I knew that theologically he and I were very different. Okay, at their church, they preach very differently than we do. We're very scripture heavy. Okay, I covered like a chapter today. But they wouldn't do as much scripture per se, but that's okay. If, if you're feeding the homeless and you're sharing the gospel and that gospel is the gospel of Jesus Christ, dude, I'm shoulder to shoulder with you. Amen? Like you share the gospel. We can argue theology later. It ultimately doesn't matter. I just want them saved. And I scoped it out. I wanted to go see if everything was, everything was you know, biblically God-honoring and fruitful. And so I got there, joined them in the parking lot, Occidental parking lot in the heart of downtown Seattle. They were going to City Hall Park Camp, which is the most dangerous homeless camp in the city. Just a few days ago, one person from that camp was arrested for going into the courthouse and attacking a woman in the bathroom stall. That's the camp we were going into the middle of. So we circled up in the parking lot and they announced the different teams. This is the preaching team, the prayer team, the food team, the delivery team. And the security team, they called the de-escalation team. So all the ex-military dudes were over there. And I, was, I, was, I, I, reached out to, I reached out to the leader. I was like, look, put me on whatever team you want to put me on. Secretly thinking like, please put me on the preaching team. And he's like, I want you on the prayer team. And I was like, great. but I just wanted to see how they do what they do. And we, we went there, we unloaded the van, we set up the tables and a giant line had already formed. The news was there and they were talking with my friend about the ministry. And you could tell the way that this journalist was framing the questions, that actually might be on the news tonight. You could tell the way he was framing the questions was like, what do you say to those who are of the opinion that what you're doing enables them? <laughs> see what I mean? And I was like, I don't trust this guy at all. And so I, had, I came over and I, I prayed with my buddy after that. I, had, I stood by him. I was worried about this because he didn't see how going and bringing food to the homeless in their camp helped remove homelessness because he doesn't believe the gospel. He doesn't know that when somebody believes it, they are transformed. Like they were dead and now they're alive. He, he doesn't get that, but he was about to see and I was at the end of the table. They were giving away these CSB Bibles. I had to send a picture of that to my old team in Nashville because I wanted them to see that. It was so cool. I was there in the design meeting and they were pitching the concepts for those. And now here they are on the table in a homeless park in Seattle and they're being given out and people are getting saved. I prayed with a man to give his life to Christ. Praise God for that real quick because that's awesome, right? But then at the same time, there was a guy who was closer to the center of the park who a man walked up holding his tray of fettuccine and he asked, can I pray for you for anything? And the man said, for deliverance. Deliverance from what? Deliverance from, is it substance abuse? And the man said, no, from the demon voices in my head. And he said, Jesse? <laughs> Last week, my boys have been in Florida for a while, and I've been missing them like crazy. Like, we talked to them on the way to church today, and I, I just, I just want to hug them. And I was praying about this, and I was like, God, I want to hug 
my sons again. Please bring them home safely. And also, if I'm honest with you, God, I really want to hug my son, Aiden. I would give anything if I could just hug Aiden. I walk up to my friend who's called me over, and I ask him, what is the demon's name? And he said, Legion. And so I opened up to the Gospel of Luke, wherein Jesus casts Legion out into a herd of pigs. I'm sorry, hackers. I know you think it's cool to call yourselves weird, call us Legion, for we are many. Look what happens to Legion in the text. It's not cool for you. It's cool for Jesus. They are terrified of my Jesus. And so I began to read this text. And as I read that text, suddenly three other homeless men holding trays of food who were minding their own business before suddenly all looked at us and began speaking loudly in tongues, walking toward us. The de-escalation team had to go and try to keep them at bay. I had to speak over them so that it could be heard. And I shared the story of Jesus casting Legion out. And I asked him, that's my Jesus. Do you want to give your life to this Jesus who cast legion out? You want to see him do it again? And you want to give your life to Christ and get off the streets today? And with tears in his eyes, he said, yes. He prayed to receive Christ. He gave me a big giant hug. He committed to go with Victory Outreach, a 12-month program that gives them professional training, helps them find an apartment and secure a job and recover from whatever substance abuse issues they have. My friend called the news guy over. He's like, here's a story for you. And he told the camera, I'm getting off the streets today. He gave me another big giant hug. I asked him his name. It's Aiden. (laughs) Praise God. This book is still happening today. That event was 15 minutes from the spot I'm standing in now. Behold what your God is capable of. We went to the park to minister to the homeless and there were fewer homeless when we left. And 100% of it is because of the gospel of Jesus Christ. 100% of it is because of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I want you to see what your God can do, Christian. I want you to see what your God can do and I want you to evangelize accordingly, not in proportion to your own powers of persuasion, your intellect, your charisma, your education or pedigree, but entirely in proportion to what your God can do. Your God who shakes prison foundations. That's what your God can do. Now pray accordingly, evangelize accordingly, bring up the gospel accordingly, fearlessly, because this is your God. This is what your God can do. This is what your God did in Philippi and in Thessalonica and in Jerusalem. Do you believe he can do it in Seattle? Yes or no? I believe he can. And it is vital to your pastor's heart that you believe your God can do this, Christian. He did it yesterday. You want to see a photo? Look at this. This is Aiden. Meet Aiden. This is a true story. You're going to love this guy. I was praying with him, gave his life to Christ, left the park that day. And then my buddy who was the pastor came over and said, look, he gave, he put a camera in Aiden's face and Aiden said, yeah, I'm getting off the streets today. And then he asked, what have you done today, news guy? (laughs) So this is praying with Aiden. Take a look at the next photo. This is Aiden just smiling. This, this also, we had a baptism service at Lake Union right afterwards. Can we praise God for what he just did in the homeless park yesterday? <laughs> so stay tuned, Redemption Church. I have found the homeless ministry that we're gonna partner with. It goes right into the heart of the most dangerous homeless camp in Seattle. All right, who's with me? I see hands, amen, praise God, praise God. This is what your God is capable of. This is what he did in Acts 16. This is what he did yesterday. I want you to join me in this. If you're a Christian and you've been settling for a status quo of evangelism in your life that is fruitless, I want you to behold what your God is capable of. And I want you to evangelize in proportion to his ability to transform cities because he has done it many times over. He can do it here today. And if you're Lydia, If you're my friend whose heart has been opened by the gospel today, 
I want you to be the first one. Would you stand with me as we close in prayer? God, I believe your gospel. I believe that it's true. By the power of the Holy Spirit of God, the same spirit that filled that church, I confess with my mouth, Jesus is Lord. Redemption Church, would you say Jesus is Lord? Say it, Jesus is Lord. I believe in my heart that God raised Jesus from the dead. Now God, by the same Holy Spirit who opened Lydia's heart, by the same Holy Spirit who transformed the jailer's family, by the same Holy Spirit who cast the demons out in Act 16 and in City Hall Park yesterday, I confess with my mouth Jesus is Lord. I believe in my heart that God raised him from the dead. Now by the very Holy Spirit described in the book of Acts, let me be saved, saved, saved. If you've prayed to give your life to Christ today, I want you to come forward and tell us. If you need, if you need to recommit yourself to evangelism in proportion to what the Holy Spirit historically has been doing for thousands of years, as he did in the book of Acts, as he's capable of today, as he did in Philippi, as he can in Seattle, would you come forward and be equipped? Come forward, come forward, come forward and be equipped. In Jesus' name, amen.